Hey everyone, welcome back to Humans and AI, the podcast exploring the crucial connection between people and technology. I'm your host, Adim Zolkar, your product design and AI expert and the creator of an online leadership program, Unlocking the Power of Generative AI. And today we're diving deep into the human side of product management, a field that's undergoing a rapid transformation with AI age. Joining us is a successful director of product from Monday.com, a leading unicorn startup. We'll be discussing the importance of the soft skills and human empathy in building great products along with valuable insights and advice from seasoned leader and in the tech world. And I want to welcome Shirley. Hi, Shirley. Hi. Hi. I'm so happy that you're here. Shirley Baumer is the ex-director of product management at Monday.com, and I'm very happy that she's with me today. Hi, Shirley. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, we're, we're live on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook, and you're so invited to join the discussion, ask questions, and now we can start. What are the, some of the most crucial soft skills that every product manager needs in, to develop and why? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so first of all, I think that um, soft skills are like really a part of the job. In product management it's not like a nice to have if you're a designer and you're also a storyteller or developer but you, you know how to communicate that that's a plus right it will make you great at what you do but for product manager um, you can't lead a team you can't uh, work with stakeholders without it um, so I think like for me number one uh, like the, the basis for all this is is empathy right because you need to understand our users and really dive deep into their world what are they experiencing what are their problems uh, their aspiration their their you know the, their dreams their motivations and and you can't do that without really putting yourself in their in their shoes um, and you can also um, and and that also implies to relationship in the office so how to work with stakeholders um, you want to make sure the CEO has a buy-in for your new feature you have to understand what they care about right they care about revenue they care about engagement they care about culture I don't know understand their motivation and then understand how to talk to them um, and I I think that that's really what separates you know a, a good person product manager from from great product management because there is something in product management that you can't like there is this extra X factor right that you can't really teach yeah um, and I, uh, yeah and I think that's yeah. that um, there is a story I really like sure <laughs> um, there is a, a story I really like from like a very distant place from Cambodia. I've been to Cambodia it's a beautiful place um, and they have a um, issue with um, iron deficiency like with anemia and there was a group of scientists from Canada that created this um, iron metal that you can put when you cook you can just add it to the pot and then whatever you cook gets more iron and people get uh, be more healthy and stuff like that and it was a very exciting revolution and Like uh, 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 innovation, like this amazing new thing. It's not expensive, it's very durable. And then a group of scientists came to like the rural uh, area of Cambodia and knocked on people's door and offered it. Um, and the local said, yeah, yeah, of course. And a few months later, they saw that nothing changed. They didn't use it, and of course, they didn't feel any better. Um, and one of the in one of the um, evenings, so one of the scientists walked, you know, in the village and uh, met uh, an old Cambodian person. And he told him about um, a lucky fish or uh, uh, something in their culture which uh, considers very fortune. And then he had this idea, like a light bulb, of taking this metal, which used to be round, and make it, turn it into a fish, like exactly the same thing, exactly the same material and everything. Uh, but now it's not a circle, it's a fish. And when they tried it now, everybody used it. It was a huge success. Iron level went up. People felt better, you know. Uh, it had an effect on the economy because people felt better. And, and I think it's such an amazing story because it tells you, you know, to... 
to, to listen and not be judgmental and understand also the context, like not only like deep diving into the specific problem you're trying to solve, but look on your user as a person, like a round person. What do they care about? What do they believe in? Where are their biases? Um, yeah, I have it yeah. with me, actually. Right. You have a coin? Like a, a yeah, I have coin? that actual metal thing in my drawer. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you should show to, me afterwards. Yeah. I would to love to see remind that. Remind myself. Uh, that's why we are here for so I, yeah for me you I'm know, really like, passionate about that most people in tech are very passionate about technology yeah. and I would say the percentage of people that are oriented to technology to the coding to the to the hardcore you know abilities cap capacities of technology is yeah. the majority I would say like more than 90 percent and 80 90 percent of people doing technology startups big companies they come from technology and they really value it and they promote people who really understand technology yeah. and it's a very because it's the core business they see that as the most important thing and then they would say okay somebody is doing product management yeah it's nice that he understands the people he could talk to the end users but first and foremost, he needs to understand the technology and what we're doing in order to work with R&D, in order to understand the limitations, so forth. I guess you heard that in the past. So yeah. how would you address this? Um, I think it's important to, I think technology is cool. <laughs> I think it's important to understand technology. Like you can't, I don't know, sell wine without understanding how they make wine, right? But um, I think that you need to understand it and, and challenge some choices, but I don't believe it's like the, um, the superpower of product management. Um, I believe that, you know, the R and D team, um, need to lead the technology and they need to lead how we are solving the problems and product management managers need to bring which problem are we trying to solve? how we measure success and the synergy is important and working together is important. You can't be complete ignorant and say like, okay, solve, solve it somehow, but that's not what you bring to the table as far as I, uh, concern, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, like there are many people I I'm in the tech field for, I don't know, like more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I remember before they were product managers. Right. Yeah. So it's like it's like 10, 15 years, 10, 15 yeah. years old, something like that. And before that, we came into startups or big organizations and the people who led the product was the R&D team. Right. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who decided the strategy and the, the path and everything. And they really implemented that, too. And I think that some of these like conceptions of what is needed from product management is still there due to to the fact that it's a technological organization and start from there and yeah. what you're saying is that people who are who has these skills and are they, they could teach themselves about the technology but they don't need to understand it deeply could be even better product managers than than people who, who are who don't have these skills and, i think because i would never understand technology better than the engineers right Right. And I want to give the I want to give them to do their own thing, um, and I want to bring my own value, and that's yeah. the as a product. So that's the value, that's the value I bring, and I believe that um, working together in a way that each one represent what they bring to the table, and I really like working with R and D from very very early stages, like I. No, when I understand like the field of com competitors and the problem and general idea of our goals, I want to work. I want to bring R and D to the table, and I want to discuss it with them, and I want to think about the solutions together. I don't work with spec, Spe uh, like I don't work with it. So, yeah. and and in that way, I think they are much more like on board, engaged. Um, in Monday, they are the most engaged engineers I ever seen because they we don't put them in a tiny, you know, uh, corner. And yeah. they get to do their thing. They get to do their art. They get to influence. 
Yeah. Do you think it's different because you're because Monday is a B two C company actually, although it works to a B two B, but it's in the end it is a, it's it's a consumer's product. Um, do you think it's different if I'm a product manager is in a deep tech technology or someone who's developing it for developers or experts in their fields? Yeah, I think like the the level of depth and and how you understand the underlying technology might be uh, greater, you know, but still I, I, I don't accept, I don't expect from a product, even from a technical product management manager who work on a technical uh, product to bring that to the table. I still want them to be, uh, what are we aiming for? How success looks like, which problem are we solving for which users? Um, how are we winning? What are the, MV what is the MVP? Um, right. There is so much in product management that like you don't need to do that also. Yeah. So looking back at monday.com growth uh, to unicorn, what are some of the key lessons you've learned about building a successful product and a company? Hmm. Um, it, it, it's a lot. It's like it's you know being a unicorn, it's like one of a, one of a million. so a lot of things have need to. To like happen together i guess um, yeah. and you've been there th from the beginning we have to mention that too yeah pretty much i was the first product manager i joined when we were 30 uh, employees and uh, the product was very basic um, um and yeah so i i've been there for lots lots of uh, uh changes and um I think that it, it sounds kind of funny, but the f you need to think big, and you need to you need to say to yourself, "I we are going to be a unicorn, <laughs> okay?" Because building a lifestyle business or building a business that every, all you want to do is just you know have an exit is very different from day one. Um, so aim aim there is a part of it, and that means a lot of things it's not only a mental thing <laughs> right it's not only imagine uh, although that's meaningful also but choosing a big market for example okay I, I i think it's very very hard i wouldn't say impossible but i think it's very hard to be a unicorn if you go to a niche market or if you're building a niche product for a big market so i think the combination of a big market with a um, core offering is something that really I think it's like the basic of, of being a, a unicorn. So in Monday's case, you know, the market is every team that works together on a computer. It's a lot of people. It's 1.2 billion people around the world. Um, and Monday works across, you know, 200 industries, 180 countries, tech, non-tech, enterprise, SMBs, everything. And what and the offering is something in the core of the business. It's not a nice to have, it's not a nuanced thing. So I think that is very, very important. Um, it's not enough, right? But it's like uh, the basics. Um, and, and also like you, you need to aim high and set very, very ambitious goals, but you also need to make sure you reach them. <laughs> So I think that everything around like measurements and being very, very on top of like reality check, how, how are you progressing towards your goal um, is very meaningful. Um, so in Monday, when it started with five, um, five companies who used Monday as customers and they were all friends of the founders. Okay. We didn't have like the online marketing and stuff like that. So the, there was a huge dashboard on all of the walls in the office with the, with five, <laughs> there are five. And every day in the morning, the CEO, uh, in like, um, in the all hands said today we have five customers and the next day we have five customers and five customers and then we had six and it was very very exciting um so i think that that's very important to measure everything to put very concrete goals to be on top of that to create cadences around that it's not enough to set goals it's not enough to measure it's how you communicate it's the language you speak so um 
I think it was a meaningful part of, of, of Monday's success and it was there from day one. Mm-hmm. Um, there were dashboards on, and still on covering all the walls with what's the revenue, how many people, um, how many, you know, conversion rates, uh, predictions, goals. Are we meeting our goals? Are, aren't we meeting our goals? And everybody could see it. Even people who just came to visit or even people who came for a job interview. Like we didn't hide anything. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something which is very, very meaningful. And, and it's a, also a huge part of the culture, which maybe leads me to the third part of like the work culture of, you know, bring the best people, give them all the context they need about strategy, goals, the market, data, everything, like, but give them freedom. <laughs> to reach there. So um, at some point we saw that uh, Netflix call it loosely coupled and highly aligned. Okay. And they have a whole thing around it. Very interesting. And we felt that, wow, they're working like us. Um, so it, it's um, bring great people and, and set very ambitious goals and give all the support you need with tools, you know, with transparency, with everything. But don't be obsessed about how people get where they, where, you know, it's not about the how, it's about where. Um, and that means that people can choose to do features you don't believe in as leaders, and it's okay. If they show why they're doing it, if they work fast, if they fail fast, if they, you know, come to conclusions about and pivot, it's okay. You don't need to approve everything as leaders. And that's not so trivial. Right. Mm-hmm, so, sure. so er, yeah, everything, everything around that, um, like from one, like very, very high standards, but also give people, you know, the freedom to, to work. And as soon as you uh, get to the goals that we both, both agreed on, it's okay if you want to do it in the way I thought, of, the way I thought there are 10,000 ways to get to a certain point. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of I things, think that, I think that these are like the, the main thing. Yeah. I think what you mentioned about the freedom is a way to get good people. Because if you want to have a very good a team and people who want to be like interested and really into what you're doing, you need to give them the opportunity to be influenced, uh, influencing the product and to do things that they believe in uh, and not being strict about it. Uh, I believe that once you're very strict, um, you will get people who are more obedient and less uh, enthusiastic about doing things. Yeah. And also the other way around, because if you don't bring like the A players, so you can, you don't trust them as much and, you know, and then you have, and then you have to limit them and make all of these uh, processes or approval chains and stuff like that in order to minimize risks and minimize mistakes. Yeah. And that's not a good way to work because like lead, no matter how talented you are as a leader, you can't be in the details. You can't. Um, yeah. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. So how has the rise of AI and automations changed the role of product managers as you see it? I think that we're just starting to see, to see it. Um, just a second, I need the charger for my computer. <laughs> sure. Very important. <laughs> and yeah, battery is important. So just one second. I think that we start to see it like in the fringes, in the edges, right? Um, so... Um, and when I, as a product manager, if I wanted to meet users, interview them, talk with them, it was a lot of hustle, scheduling it, summarizing it, sharing it with everybody, writing the email t- took a lot of time. And today, most of it can be automated completely, right? Like sending the email, scheduling appointment, summarizing, um, all of that. And that's a lot of time. Um, competitor analysis, market analysis. And today you can ask 
what is pro what is work management what is product management who are the main you know competitors or and 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 you have answers so it doesn't replace it but it gives you um, a very good um, starting point um, but still I don't think we see from my perspective like maybe maybe other people would say other thing but from my perspective I don't think uh, think that today's it's already you know revolutionized I think there is still lots of room for uh, for change and um, and and I believe that when this technology would be more you know advanced and when this technology would be more implemented in day to day it will actually help product managers to be more like foster their their humanity like robots will help you to be more more human and work on your human skills because for example okay and uh, when i started to be a product manager i had to learn sql um like the coding language to you know work with analyze data and it took a lot of time it, like to learn sql and it took a lot of time to query the data a lot like hours and hours sometimes hours a day and i didn't do it as well as an analyst because i was you know prone to mistakes and stuff like that and it's very technical work i believe that in the future you can ask in a you know natural language questions how many users what is the frequency what is the correlation stuff like that and get like very good answers and accurate answers and um, so that's hours and hours and hours of work that you can now invest in other stuff um, but you know AI would never be able I think maybe I'm wrong but AI I don't think AI can uh, help you to know which questions to ask what to ask the data right and yeah. that's that that's often you know the issue um, also today like people you know get data a lot of data I want to know stuff but what what do you want to know yeah um so I Yeah, so that, that's one aspect. And, and, and like I said, market, market analysis. Today it's quite limited still because the data is not, uh, is not updated. And, you know, I, as, as a product manager and as a product leader, I spend so much time in, you know, trying the features of our competitors, reading investor notes, reading interviews to the media, um, reports, you know, uh, Gartner, stuff like that. And... I think AI can do that. It's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of time that's being saved. Yeah. Um, but, but from the other hand, meeting people, meeting your users, talking with them, understanding them better, you know, be curious about their lives, about their problems, about their aspiration, is things that no one can replace, right? Yeah. A machine yeah. cannot understand like your... The subtext, the cultural context, um, facial expressions in a way that, you know, um, and, and I often see in product teams that people don't have time for that. They don't have time for yeah. that. It's so much yeah, easier course. to look on the data, right? Yeah. But, and data is important, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Right, right. Right. Um, and what, what you mentioned is that the work of a product manager could, could be much easier. easier or faster instead of doing things manually. On the other hand, many companies take their product into a more AI powered uh, technology saying like, we have this product, but we're going to add features or capabilities with AI, mm -hmm. for example. Um, do you see that as something that is changing the way that we do product management because we need the more data because it's um, less supervised and what what if it's a, if it's a, an assistant for example you get an answer that you cannot always predict so forth do you need that do you think that they need different capacities in some cases you mean product managers yeah for an AI product mm hmm Okay, I understand the question now. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> like it's a whole new, like it's a whole new area. Like it's, it's a whole new thing in your toolkit that you have to master. Like as a product manager, you know how to work with data, you know, A-B tests, you know, competitor analysis, you know, user interviews and so on and so on. You have to know how to work with AI. Otherwise you're not, you're not relevant, right? Uh, what is the what the con what the control the technology what are the options 
um, of AI, how to work with it um, as an engineer, as a product, as a user. I think it's something that every product manager needs to do and needs to do fast because it's already here. And if you don't, if you don't master it, so, so you're behind. It's not... Um, up until recently, it was a very specific, specific specialization, right? Of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of product managers. I'm a product manager uh, with an AI background. Like, I don't yeah. know, 1 to 20. <laughs> but yeah. no, no, no. Everybody needs to do that. And, you know, in Monday, we have, uh, when we started, uh, when we started uh, implementing uh, AI, it's just, it's still the beginning. But we are starting so we we started with a small like plan of of uh, uh, with of like ambassadors of uh, specific teams specific people who lead it and add features, but but the idea behind it was that everybody would do it. It's not that this team that's doing AI everybody should do it, but we need to start with a few uh, to have. Uh, to create success, to see how it looks like, to mo mentor them very closely, uh, but then it has to be, it it will have to be a commodity. It will have to be common knowledge. Yeah. By the way, I've been to to Monday at least a few times, I and mean, I know several people. One of my previous guests was Yoni from from Monday. He was responsible for the AI team, if I remember correctly. And Yoni Levin. Yeah, uh, he was here. So when you talked about it, I remind, I, it's reminded me yeah. about, of him. Yeah, from, from the R&D perspective, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what are some of the challenges and opportunities you see for product managers in the future? So I think it's a lot about what we've discussed because the profession is evolving uh, in both dimensions. Also, as um, how, how you work, as we said, right? Like you spend less time on this mundane task, but you have to um, make sure that um, as a human, you won't, be you won't be replaceable. Like you need to invest more time in strategy thinking, strategic thinking, um, I think in user interviews, uh, spend more time, you know, creating a, a strategy, a plan, a vision, um and less time about the other stuff um and you'll have to master it because otherwise you'll be replaceable um and so that's one aspect and the other aspect that you also have to stay ahead of your curve in the products you you develop in the products you build you you can't um also in very traditional industries you, you will have to you know leapfrog if you are going to insurance, if you are going, I don't sure. know, you, banking, have to leap, finance. Banking, yeah, you have to leapfrog uh, the competition. You want to be able to do the same. Um, and we, I, I can say that in Monday, we think about it a lot because Monday is now a multi-product company, right? So I, I just left, so I still talk in, okay. in present mode, but um, I uh, lead or used to lead the work management, like the, the, the main product of, of Monday.com, but we also have a CRM and we have a, a tool for, for developers like Jira and, and more. And, and then the, the teams that build these products and also myself, we, we always ask ourselves, it's not what the competitors have and how we can do the same features and have like a feature, um, be like feature complete. We have the opportunity because we build it now and we didn't build it five, 10, sometimes 20 years ago. We have the opportunity to leapfrog. We have the opportunity to really understand what is, again, I'm, I'm going back to that. What is the problem we are trying to solve and so on and how do we solve it in a completely new way? Completely new. Um, and it takes a lot. It takes a lot of creativity, you know, and very deep thinking. Um, you can't like copycat your your competitors anymore. You won't win like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's exciting also. Yeah, it's more interesting to do several things and to think yeah. about things differently than just you know understanding exactly what would be the 
uh, like a few percentage more than the what you currently have and the competitors have and it's much harder to differentiate yourself or to sell your product if it's not much much better than something that people already use right now so yeah uh, you have to know that how can product managers effectively build relationships and uh, with stakeholders and collaborate across different teams so I like to think about stakeholders as users <laughs> um right because you as you know uh, as a product person who leads a team or as a product leader who who leads several teams or organization or you sell something <laughs> and what you sell is the features you're building and you want to make sure that the stakeholders like the users they, they buy it and for that you need to understand what do they care about what are they measured on okay so I gave before the example of the CEO so if you want to um, maybe I'll go one step back I think it's very important super important to invest a lot of time and a lot of work to sell your ideas okay so before you do something not just say I'm working on this in this feature it's really cool but like really invest energy in explaining in like a I like to do like decks like presentations of why is this impactful why it's meaningful why it will move the I don't the company forward okay so I, I sometimes as a product manager I had decks of like I don't know 100 uh, slides that explains or 50 slides that explains why it's meaningful and I will show like data points and use snippets from interviews and competitors and data and stuff like that. So, because when you have, when, when the upper management and when stakeholders, when they are, when they really get it, <laughs> why it's important and they share the same excitement as you do, it will be much easier for you, you know, to, to work. It will be much easier to get resources more developers. It will be much easier when things don't go as expected. When you have issues, they will have much more patience. They won't say, okay, it's not working. Let's shut it. But they understand why are you doing what you're doing? Where are you aiming? So, so that's one aspect. Okay. Like really, really invest a lot in uh, pitching it, explaining how, wh why it will make an impact, why it will make a difference. And the second part is create a cadence around it. So it's not enough, like if you're working on something, it's not enough to really uh, make everyone excited about the mission, about why you're doing stuff, but also to keep them always uh, updated and create a very, very regular beat and cadence around um, how you share progress. I think it's very important. Uh, for example, every two weeks, you send some sort of summary um, what I did, um, what are, what did I learn and what will I do next? Like every two weeks, what did, what I learned, what I, what I, uh, from data, from user interview, where I'm standing and what should I do next? And I think that creates lots of confidence. Okay. So if we talked, uh, earlier on give people freedom you can't give them unlimited freedom um, but if you give it in these boundaries of okay you can reach the goals we discussed with however you like but let's see every week or every two weeks or every month I don't know um, where where are you progressing and have a, um, also um, a place to give feedback that's also important for leaders. I want to influence, I want to tell something. And when you don't give me the room to tell something, to tell my feedback, I get very frustrated and very hateful <laughs> and resentful. And yeah. you don't want that <laughs> also, because you yeah. know you, they, they can flip and say, okay, it's, it's not working, it's shit, like close it. Right. Also not good. So yeah, so I think these cadences is very, very, very important to, to, to create confidence and, and, and really to get feedback. Sometimes you really need to get feedback. It's very helpful. Um, and, and, and the way to do it, I think you should tailor to every um, like a role. 
um, because in, in every company and every culture and whatever, it won't always be a meeting where you show a presentation of what you did. Um, for example, if you want the CEO to be on board, they don't have time for that, right? So, and, and, and if it's important for them to be on board, you can ask them, how do you, what is the best way to uh, communicate progress with you? Okay, like for example, in Monday, the CEOs, they work with WhatsApp. That's how they work. They don't work with email. They don't get in the plot, like nothing. And it's not the most ideal way to communicate progress about business and about features, but that's the best way because that's where they are. So you will have to learn as a leader to communicate progress in WhatsApp. <laughs> you'll have to yeah. do it. And other leaders, they really like to be in the details and they really like to see the product. So I used to, you know, uh, even in very early stages of development, like only when you have something like a prototype, something that's hardly working, I would send them and see, look, it's really cool. Check it out. And it will be reassuring for them because they will see that there is progress and like put them in, uh, in your world uh, to mm -hmm. see the same things that you see, but in a way that fits them. You know, yeah. and it's the same for other um, teams. Sometimes to get to your goal as a team or as an organization, you have to collaborate. Like you don't work in a complete silo. You often don't work in a complete silo. You need other people on board sometimes. So, and, and then again, you need to understand what do they care about? What are their goals? Uh, the other team, what are their KPIs? And most likely that if you don't, if you're not aligned with their KPIs, it will be very, very hard uh, to get them on board. So we have to understand sure. that from scratch and also update them as well. Yeah. Uh, and you have to work in it. It's not always so fun. <laughs> but Yeah, it's like the, the next thing that, that came to my mind is like you're describing this collaborative organization that everybody is like, thinking together they're all aligned this is the direction you know where we are where we're going it's like and everybody's aligned but I the next thing that came to my mind as you said is like sometimes people don't agree they don't agree with the direction they don't agree with the implementation of the direction they don't agree with the specific goals you're going so you could say okay I'm the director of a product I, I'm I'm the one who's deciding but I feel that this is not the approach you would probably have so how would you um, make this happen when people are, are sometimes more confrontational or less agreeing with what you're doing? Yeah. So I think it ha like in a healthy organization, you have some, first of all, you have some sort of like strategy, right? Like, so if as a product director, I have this direction, this initiative, it, it will have to be aligned with the general strategy. Like if I do something which is completely off, most chances, yeah, I won't get so much buy-in from stakeholders. So that's like very generally speaking. Um, and if you are already in this path um, and you create this, the, the places to give feedback, so the feedback can also be, no, it's not a good direction. And then I can say, I think it is because this and this and that. But we will have to decide and we will have to make a decision. Um, and, you know, the decision can, can be scratch it. It's not a good direction. And this decision can be where uh, we're changing it a little bit or we're doing it as it is because they're convinced. But, but you need to create this while you are uh, working with the main flow of the strategy, you need to create these places of, of control uh, to make sure you're on the right uh, on on the right path, uh, because otherwise, uh, it will you, not work. Yeah, that's the way to get aligned. Actually, it's not yeah. this general alignment that happens. The alignment happens when you constantly, you know, talk about your goals, talk about your initiative, talk about what matters, um, and yeah, I think that as an organization, you have to create. Um, yeah, a clear strategy to communicate it, clear product principles. Um, generally speaking, 
to, uh, to, to make sure that different teams don't clash too much, right? Yeah. Um, so th there, yeah. there is the, the organizational thing and there is what you can do as, you know, PM, uh, product team lead director and so on, so on. So, so you mentioned that like negotiation is another skill that you might need sometimes. It's not enough to be clear and to be empathic and to understand your users and stakeholders. Sometimes I guess that you need to know how to negotiate and not be too strict about what you believe. Yeah, definitely. Also, also inside a team, a lot of times, you know, um, product manager thinks X and the developer thinks Y and the designer and everybody has their own opinion and they have strong opinions and they're very passionate passionate and and you can see you know you, you know it right the sure. um, but as a as a product manager you also need to be a little bit of you know a coach and to understand okay that's your uh, perspective why are you saying it what's important for you and you know find the common um, and, and often you can find re resolution um, and I think a very effective way to do it is to go back to the initial assumptions right like the initial why are we doing like very <laughs> why are we doing what we're doing what is the goal we set to ourselves what is the problem we're trying to solve okay we agreed on that, right? We agreed on the goal, we agreed on the user persona, we agreed on the problem. So is it aligned? Is it solving the actual problem? Um, uh, we said that we're going to launch in a month and a half from now. If we'll do that, what are the trade-off? Um, so, so yeah, I think these types of uh, being the negotiate, and negotiation skill, problem solving skills, uh, conflict resolving skills, um, is 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 very very uh, meaningful. Uh, yeah. What excites you most about the future of technology? Hmm. Um, I think that there are so many you know big problems <laughs> in the world today right um, and I really hope that um, we would see more of like doing good by doing well and technology for for good for actually putting the best minds and the best technology and all the energy in solving like major real world problem like uh, you know climate and, and hunger and stuff like that. I really believe we have power um, as people in the tech who knows how to do stuff, <laughs> how to make things happen at large scale. Uh, I think for me, I really, really want to be in a future where we put a lot of this energy um, into these type of things. Um, I came back earlier uh, from a meeting with the CEO of Active Fence and they, this amazing startup who build, make the internet safer from, you know, pedophilia and terror and misinformation and, and extremely successful, extremely cool startup, really talented people. And there isn't a contradiction there between like doing good, doing well. Um, yeah, I would love to see more of these, I guess. I see. Okay, so we're almost done. I have two more questions. What is your number one tip for entrepreneurs today? Mm. I think it would be around uh, the people you're working with. Um, I think that uh, especially in small startup, it's super, super important like not to compromise and to bring like a uh, a types uh, a players um, because you can change the product you can change the market you can do a lot of things when unexpected things happen you know when I worked my years in Monday we had coronavirus we had a war 
lots of political problems in Israel, lots of things, very challenging. And the reason we came stronger from all of these um, was, I think, yeah, the, the culture and the people. And I think that's the most important thing for mm. me. I see. And where could people meet you or hear more about what you what your work is? Like on LinkedIn would be a good place. Yeah, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Instagram. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Shirley. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been very insightful and I learned a lot. So sure. thanks. It was great talking to you too. Sure. And to all of you change makers out there, thank you for joining us. I invite you to sign up for my new online pro leaders program, Unlocking the Power of Generative AI, designed to equip leaders with the skills to build successful generative AI products. And I'll see you next week. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.